in the recording. That would be great. Okay, uh, nice to see you all. Uh, thank you again for coming and welcome to day two of our honors showcase where our grad with you their capstone honors projects. Um, thanks for your support for honors students. Uh, each of our students has worked with a faculty mentor uh, on these final projects and uh, I would like to offer a special thank you to those faculty mentors who take the time to work with our students. This program cannot run without the partnership of um, faculty working together with students. So thank you all. Um, if you have worked with uh, students directly, um, I, you may agree with me that it's one of the best parts of teaching in that one-to-one -one capacity. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. We will have four presenters today. Um, each presenter will talk for about 10 minutes each. And once they are all done, at that point, we will open up the floor to questions and comments from the audience. And I will ask you um, to hold your questions and comments until then. Uh, when we get to that point, um, you can feel free to raise your electronic hand as we're all now used to doing or your real hand or put a, a comment in the chat. And Lisa, uh, Noel and I will be monitoring that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this session will uh, later be included on our Honor Showcase webpage. Um, so you can uh, take a second look if you'd like to uh, soon. Um, some students who are not able to present live will also have their um, presentations pre-recorded and put on our Honor Showcase page. Okay, so that is the housekeeping. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd love to get right to our first presenter. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Gould. Michael's uh, project is called Imagine a City. And Michael, I will turn it over to you whenever you're ready. Please go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael, as you just heard. Uh, I'm an animation major at our school's art department, and I chose to do a city design for my project. So let's get into it. Um, as an animator, I've always been fascinated with the idea of bringing my thoughts to life. And several years ago, I started a project to create a story within a world of my original design. Uh, now, there are many important locations within this story that I've always wanted to be able to visualize. And the goal of this project is to create a system for constructing these locations realistically to later be applied to my narrative and visual storytelling process. So the location I chose to focus on for this project is called the City of Glass, and it is one of the first locations that my characters visit within the story. And so now that we have that little debriefing out of the way, let's go ahead and get into it. So this is the first thing that I had to create. This is an overview map of the uh, city design. And as you can tell, I took very literal inspiration from the name of the city and I designed its initial appearance off of a plate of broken glass. Um, so over here, if you see the map, you look and you see these uh, little grid squares. These are all seven acres worth of land. And it's kind of a random number if you question it, but it's um, actually based off of the total population of the city and which is 20,000 people so I had to sort of adjust the scale of the city in order to fit a correct amount of people and seven acres is just enough to fit about 35 single family homes and overall that's a thousand acres so there's 144 of these little squares representing that amount of land. Uh, but that's not quite enough in order to really get the idea of what this place looks like, because you have to understand population density too, in order to understand, you know, how many houses are placed in a location, what sort of houses, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you just go off of the previous map, then it would be, you know, 35 single family homes per square, and that's the entire city. So that's what this first map is. You can see that there's a larger density in the center of the city and it slowly decreases as you go outwards. That's just the trend that I chose based on the narrative elements of my city. Uh, obviously it's not very realistic, but that's just how I chose to represent it. Uh, and over here we have a zone map, which allows me to basically take those intersections between the major road systems, which are these lines here. A zone is just the areas that are created between them. And that allows me to later uh, write down a bunch of information about everything that goes into that zone so we can see how many of a certain type of house, how many um, 
you know, important buildings, different landmarks, so on and so forth. And that allows me to later go in and illustrate that more easily. Next up, this is one of the most fun parts of the project for me. I really had a ton of fun making this map over here. This is an elevation map of the city. So down in this little corner, we can see an expanded view. The city is actually surrounded by a mountain range down here. And this is all forested area. So it's a very secluded city uh, for the narrative elements of it. And you can see this is 1.56 miles. So an interesting little fact is that if you stood that on its, uh, if you stood up vertically, it would be 200 plus feet taller than the highest point of the mountain, which is 8,000 feet tall. And so that was a fun little detail that I realized you get to see a lot of cool comparisons when you make maps like this over time. Uh, and then also this map over here, I took that and I created an elevation abstraction. So this isn't what the place actually looks like. It's just a sort of guide to show you the basic elevation shifts over time. So we have, this will be a little hill that comes out into this area down here, and then this will be a little lake. Uh, but yeah, that's the gist of that part. And then, so now we get to put all of this information into context for the first time. So what do those houses actually look like when you zoom in and get up close with it? So these are different types of houses represented by squares. This is a four person house, three person, two person, single person. And then this is a mansion, which we will see more of later on. Uh, each of these squares is 10 yards or 30 feet. And it's the same as this map over here, the same representation. So each of these squares, these larger squares is one acre and the entire map is seven acres. So now you get the reference point of what these squares are because this can fit into this map 144 times, which is once again, a really cool thing to just think about and observe. Um, I believe this location is actually sitting somewhere right about here between two squares. And then this is the mansion. Once again, I changed the shape to be more accurate to what I was going for. But that's not all you can do with this because um, you can create a 3D model now of, of that top-down map that I just showed you. And this is a program that I got the pleasure of using for the first time the other day and putting all this together. This is called SketchUp. Uh, and I used it to basically, you know, go into the more creative aspect of this where I get to lay out what kind of houses I want, what direction I want them all going in you know, what the elevation of this smaller section of land is. So this is actually cutting into that hill area that you saw on the larger elevation map. That's the very tip of it. And that is the mansion once again. Now we can see what it looks like in 3D space. And so now you get an idea of what this project is used for is I can use this to illustrate different perspectives throughout the city and really just use this for background designs, for um, animations or any sort of project that I want to work on, I can literally move the camera into the city and choose what I want to see or what I want the audience to see. And so now that we have this, we have our mansion here and that's the final focal point of this presentation is I wanted to show that you can take this all the way from that big overview map all the way down to a single point on the map. And I chose to make that point the mansion. And so this is a Gothic mansion. The city has a lot of uh, neo-Gothic architecture within it. And so I did a lot of research into neo-Gothic architecture, basic, you know, different images, different components. And I started putting together thumbnails and drawing different aspects of that. And then when it came to this step, I started using imaginary architecture to sort of bring my design for this um, mansion together. So you can see I eventually came up with a sort of top-down view, which I took and converted to an isometric projection. And then from here, instead of going with the 3D modeling route, I decided to do this one on paper, which, you know, sounds kind of crazy because of all those lines that you see with this x-ray view of it. Uh, but really, it's important to understand the entirety of the structure, because if I were to just try to draw this from imagination without understanding the shape, you know, from every angle of it, 
I wouldn't be able to get the smaller details of what's behind these larger front structures here, like these back areas, such as this, that you can't see from the camera's perspective. Uh, but that's the basic idea of my project, and that's all I have to show for you today. So thank you for joining me. Michael, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm especially interested in, in looking at those hand drawings and how they turn out into that, that 3D model. So super interesting. Thank you very much for your work, uh, Michael. Okay, and uh, if you would stop your screen sharing, Michael, we'll go on to our second presenter. Thank you. Uh, also, I see that Vice President Suzanne Buglioni has joined us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Buglioni, for being here and for your uh, support for the honors program. Much appreciated. Uh, second presenter today um, with the title of Multicultural Families Reimagining the Family Tree for the Classroom is Shanna Mazelkowski Krawitz. And Shanna, I'm sorry, I practiced your last name 10 times, but I probably still messed it up. So <laughs> Shanna, when you're ready, please go ahead. Okay, and it shows, all right. Okay, let's see. Where am I? Sorry about. Oh, okay. So I have decided to do my project on um, the idea of the family tree in the classroom. I have a passion for like genealogy um, and searching my family history. And I remember when I first started subbing in my child's school that, you know, they kind of touched upon it briefly. But as I looked at the makeup of the class, I realized that like, there were so many different types of children coming from so many different backgrounds that the genealogy that I know just didn't quite add up to what the makeup of the classroom was. So. I think before we can explore it further, I think it's understanding what is genealogy and a family tree. Um, the family tree is a visual element that's used to give you an accurate representation of, you know, from one person, this is how, you know, this person has come to be. This is the multiple generations that got us to where we are. Um, Genealogy right now is very popular with Ancestry.com and all of like as a hobby, it's very popular right now. Um, its origins, you know, when you look at it is, it's something that we've always done as a civilization. Um, even in the beginning before we had written language, uh, there, was, there was always stories um, of family lines that led to royalty and it linked those that were empowered to like trying to trace their lineage back to the the gods that they were that they were celebrating and worshiping and as time went on you know these people in power wanted to have more control over the people that they ruled over and you know they started making more accurate records and as these records went on they needed a way to um determine if you know who was going to control land who was nobility who is who belonged to what and where they belonged. And so we now have a trail of records. And as we've emerged into our digital technologies, we are learning all kinds of new things um, about our history, about our lineage. And it's kind of grown so proportionally that I think it needs to focus back in the classroom for children in a way that they can digest. Um, when we look at a classroom, now these stats were from 2014. Uh, I'm sure they have changed significantly since then because the way our, our society works is we're always evolving and we've been evolving pretty rapidly in terms of our acceptance and understanding of different types of people and different households. Um, there are more children with same-sex parents. There are a significant number of children that have single parents. Um, Interracial marriage is, as of 2014, was up 15%, but I suspect as, as we look at things, that's more commonplace than you would believe, um, than the percentage would tell you. And all these children come into the classroom, and when they talk about families, everybody's different. 
um, a lot of talk about families in our current classrooms is based on that 1950s nuclear unit of a family. The more conservative approach, the mom stays home and cooks, the father goes out and brings home all the money, the children go to school and play quietly and listen to parents at all times. Um, it doesn't really account for the idea that, you know, some, some children are in foster families, some are adopted, there are step families, there's divorce, there's LGBTQ families, there's single parents, there's multi-generational households. Um, and more so now than ever before, there's also the family that we select. Um, it's not just about blood anymore. It's not about, you know, who I'm blood related to so much as it's who we bring into our lives and interact with on a daily basis. Um, the reliance in the classroom, you know, in a lot of family tree scenarios also um, lean heavily on documented, uh, documented information. Um, and for a lot of kids, that information is hard to come by, whether it's be through adoption, whether it's through foster care, immigration, refugee status, you know, when these people come into this country, when everybody comes into this country under refugee status, they're leaving their home behind, they're leaving everything they know behind. And sometimes those records, those family records are also left behind. So we have to focus a little less on the, on the technicality for children in the classroom, teaching them about the family and focus more on, you know, the elements that make us unique and the elements that bring us together. Um, when we talk with children, they're concerned about the world around them. They, they need to explore how everybody interacts and how everybody is different, but the same and how they can all connect to each other in a, in a classroom. That's what I think discussing um, like a family tree and family history and genealogy can do for a, a young classroom, especially. Because when, they, when the children talk about their home experiences, some of these children have, some of these children have multiple relatives that other children aren't necessarily familiar with the terms. Um, for instance, my daughter talks about her Jaju and her Meme, which Jaju is Polish for grandfather, Meme is uh, French Canadian for grandmother. Other children have other children have nanas, they have oddies, they have grandma and grandpas, they have nanas and nonos. So as the children learn about these different um, these different families, they learn that you know everybody has their own version of a grandmother. Some don't, some do. There are other children who have older people in their lives that they look at as a grandmother-like person and they can share it in the classroom um, through more open terms of a family tree and not just saying, this is your mother, this is your father, this is their parents, this is their parents. Um, for older, older children, genealogy and family tree, it can help them learn to differentiate um, a lot of what we like to call, you know, false information nowadays. It's, there's a, there, there can be, there's a renewed focus on correct information from primary and secondary sources. Um, judging the quality of content online is a very important lesson nowadays. Um, and there are a lot of creative ways to get children to incorporate some reference skills and practicing interpersonal skills as they get older. So my focus is on first grade. My daughter's in first grade, I'm working in first grade. And so I'm looking at this family tree situation from a very young perspective. I would love to see family trees brought back into the classroom, but not in the conventional sense of a tree. So I was doing some research on books that explore families and there, there are numerous books that have been developed, I would say in the last 10 years or so. Um, prior to 10 years, the books were not plentiful. Um, they didn't explore the diverse variety of families that there are today. And 
instead of focusing on a nuclear family as part of like the family tree where a child has to, you know, indicate their mother and their father and their siblings, um, it is, my focus is on getting them to create a project where they can see themselves in the whole of their classroom. So with first grade, everything is about stories. Um, we love to read stories. We love to teach these children about differences and acceptance through these stories. Some great stories that I found in my research were Our Class is a Family by Shannon Olson, Family, Families, Families by Susan Lang, and The Family Book by Todd Parr. These explored a large variety of differences within families. And it refocuses the idea of what we find in as family. Um, you know, after reading these books, there is room for open discussion with the classroom. You know, what makes it, what makes them different from the rest of the room that they're proud of? Or what makes them unique? What makes them the same? What, what are some similarities and differences? And children love to do crafts. And the vision I had when I first started this, this project was, it can be on a classroom level, it could be on a grade level, and it could also be on a school-wide level. But every classroom, is like a family. So that family in the classroom, the teacher is the tree. They are the trunk of this tree. That is their classroom. And every child in that room is a leaf on that tree, just like that classic family tree depiction. But each of these children have completely different backgrounds. So this family tree, um, which, you know, theoretically you could construct it on a bulletin board, um, the idea of having they have a nice variety of leaves that they could put their names on that they could attach to the tree, whether it's again, like I said, classroom, grade level, or school wide. Um, it's a great project. And then for a bulletin board, um, like my visual depiction here is like a little paper flower. Well, in that flower, the idea is that you have your child, the child's name at the center. And instead of doing like, this is your mother, this is your father, this is who you came from. The idea is that the children would write the names of the people that are family in their lives, regardless of the designation, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, a close family friend, a grandmother, you know, maybe it's three grandmothers and, you know, two fathers and three mothers in some cases. Um, it's, it, it allows for the child to determine what their family is. And flowers can be unique and varied as the children in the classroom. Um, so that would be, that's like the lesson part of my project. And that didn't skip. Okay, so throughout my research, I did find, and it looks like it stopped sharing on the presentation scale. So I'll just leave it here. Um, through my research, I found a lot of very, very helpful websites to coach and help teachers um, with some ideas and learning materials and resources. Um, two sites I found were Learning for Justice, which is has a lot of focus on professional development of multicultural families and diversity and the various makeups of children in the classroom and how to better integrate them and teach them all together. Um, and then Welcome Schools has a large, they have a large selection of lessons plans about diversity and multiculturalism that is very, um, was very helpful. Some of the scholarly texts that I did um, see a lot of references to, I couldn't get my hands on the cultural, uh, culturally responsive teaching theory and research, but Geneva Gay is a very prominent person um, in the world of teaching diversity. Um, she has some great, great work to read. And then um, The Funds of Knowledge was, I believe is a book written in the 90s. Um, I do have the book and it basically ties in together with this idea that you're teaching from the kids' experiences. You're pulling their world into the classroom and using their world to help better educate them about what is around them. 
Um, it's playing to their strengths by getting to know them and bringing those resources into the classroom. And um, along with this project, I do want to make available somehow, um, I'm gonna be constructing an annotated bibliography of children's books that will be available, um, that teachers can use in the classroom. Most of them are picture books. Um, and just because it's a picture book doesn't mean it's not for all grade levels. Um, there can be a lot of rich story in a picture book, um, but children are very visual and they love, they love pictures and they love color. So it's definitely, these are some great books. And that is my project for multicultural families. Anna, thank you so much. Um, as a teacher of children's lit, I'm uh, very interested in that uh, list that you're going to come up with. So I might have to ask you to share that with me. Uh, your project strikes me really um, about the most important thing we can anyone can give to a child, which I think is that they belong, that they're part of a family, and to give a child that agency um, to define who that family is. I, I love that concept. So thank you so much, Shanna, for your work. Okay, um, and now we'll be going on to our third presenter, uh, Kennedy White, whose project is titled Inhuman. Kennedy, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, um, oh, I forgot to share my screen, okay. <laughs> All right, let's see, here's Good that. And then, <laughs> um, here we go. All right. Um, hi, my name is Kennedy White and my pronouns are he and him. And this is my project in human, um, the invisible orientation. It is, um, the project itself was an educational booklet um, designed by me, researched by me, the illustrations are by me, everything from the ground up is entirely done by me. Um, and it's intended for pretty much everyone. It's intended for people who are questioning the orientation, um, parents, allies, educators, um, pretty much like everyone. Um, and I picked it because while there's definitely like a lot more um, hostility and um, negativity and more focus on people who are trans and gay, and I myself am trans and, and, trans and gay, um, something that I think is pretty obvious is that there is loads and loads and loads of activism for trans people and gay people. Like there is absolutely no shortage of it. And unfortunately, there while there are while there is absolutely activism for asexual people, it's not nearly as like visible. Like it's 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 it's, it's invisible. And um, while that can be partially explained by asexuals not experiencing the same types of oppression as trans people and gay people, like there's nobody currently trying to legislate asexuality out of existence, or like there's no sort of attacks towards them. But make no mistake, asexuals do experience some types of um, oppression. There is um, a lot of horrible things that we go through. And um, additional reason why I picked this project is because um, I kind of just realized that if I wanted there to be more activism and more awareness for asexuality, that I might as well just like do it myself. Because while I am trans and gay, and I'm more likely to experience hardship because of those identities that I have, um, there's they don't really need, need if, I, if I had to pick just one, the one that needs me the most is asexuality because the other two, like they have loads of activism. Like there's, I mean, there's always room for more, but you know, and also like, I'm just tired of being misunderstood all the time. Like it feels like over the years, there's been more and more and more like activism and awareness about LGBT identities in general over the years. But um, stuff for um, asexuality, quality and aromanticism it hasn't really caught up um and uh yeah i'm hoping to change that and um asexuality is asexuality it's a sexual orientation um it's actually the a in the extended lgbta acronym um it's a common misunderstanding that some people think the a stands for ally which i'm sorry to say it doesn't um the a stands for asexual it also stands for aromantic and agender um, even though we love and appreciate allies so much, uh, they're, they're not queer, so obviously they're not in the acronym. Um, asexuality is defined just by um, you do not experience sexual attraction, um, regardless of gender. Um, it has nothing to do with your libido. It has nothing to do with if you like sex or not, if you've had sex or not. It's just the attraction. Um, and if 
if you don't experience romantic attraction that would make you aromantic. And speaking of that, um, sexual attraction and romantic attraction are actually different. Um, most people don't realize that because for most people, they they experience them as like the exact same thing. Like if you're straight, which most people I'm pretty sure are straight, um, you would be heteromantic, heterosexual. If you're gay, you're homosexual, homoromantic. Um, and that's pretty much the case for like everyone. Like it's the exact same. They don't know the difference, which is why asexual is misunderstood. But for people who are asexual or aromantic, they are split up. Like me, for example, I am homoromantic asexual. I, I don't experience sexual attraction to anybody, but I do experience romantic attraction to other guys. And um, there's not just romantic attraction and sexual attraction either. There's other ones like down here. Um, there is aesthetic attraction, which is when you just think somebody looks nice. It's like you just think they're like, oh, that person looks nice. Um, there is sensual attraction, which is when you just want to touch someone, like hold their hand or like hug them or just be near them. Um, it can be linked to romantic attraction, but it's that's not intrinsic. Um, and there's platonic attraction, which is kind of like self-explanatory. It's um, when you want to be someone's friend and want to get to know them better. Um, yeah, so for a lot of these, they seem like they're the same exact thing. Because like if you're dating somebody, you're romantically attracted to them, you're probably sexually attracted to them, aesthetically, sensually, you think they look nice, you want to hold their hand. So for the average person, these all feel like the same exact thing, but they're not actually. Um, there's also, you probably have noticed that there is a lot of illustrations throughout this entire um, presentation and in the screenshots of the booklet. Um, I mentioned earlier that in addition to researching and just like designing the booklet, I've also done illustrations for it. And that is because in addition to being a graphic design major, I'm also a, I'm very much into illustration. Um, I've always loved like just drawing itself and coming up with like cool compositions and messing with colors and lines and stuff. And also as I was planning this project out, I realized that my own personal art style is like a direct counter to a lot of very harmful asexual stereotypes because um, a lot of age stereotypes involve us being like boring or prudish. And I feel like my art style is like the exact opposite of that. It's very lively and chaotic and angular and very interesting to look at. So I feel like, um, and they're also eye-catching. So like a big hope for this is that, you know, people will take an interest in it and actually like pick up the booklet and like read it. And so like having bright popping illustrations on there both counters the stereotype and also, you know, gets someone to go, oh, hey, what's this? And you go open it up and read it. And um, speaking of stereotypes, there is a lot of them and naturally none of them are good. Um, there is, again, there's like a whole bunch. I'm just gonna very quickly go over a couple of them. Um, a lot of people think asexuals are like, again, we're prudes. They automatically assume that we're virgins and that, you know, we're losers. They think that, you know, oh, we're just identifying as asexual. We just made it up because we can't get any. Um, they assume that we have like little to no social skills that are socially awkward. They think we're just attention seeking. Um, they assume that we've been traumatized and like that's why we're asexual if someone hurt us. Um, they get ase asexuality mixed up with people who are absent or celibate. And the big difference is that one is a choice and one is an orientation. Um, people who are celibate are typically, um, they do experience sexual attraction and they're actively making a choice not to engage in those acts. And um, again, whether or not you have sex has nothing to do with asexuality because you can, you can in fact be asexual and have and enjoy sex. It's, it has nothing to do with the action itself, but just the attraction. And um, I also wanted to mention um, where some of these stereotypes might have come from. Um, I feel, I feel like, you know, sex um, sex, and whether or not you can have it and whether or not your people desire that way is like very, very prominent in our like culture. Like a lot of advertisements and everything is like, you know, like you'll see ads for stuff that has nothing to do with that at all, but they'll, like, they'll use like scans and cloud women to advertise it. Like, um, and there's like a lot of people who feel bad about themselves if like no one likes them or they feel bad that like they've hit a certain age and they're still a virgin, or they feel bad that they haven't had enough partners, or they feel like they've had too many partners. Um, whether or not you can have sex is like, or whether or not like um, 
they treat it as a method of self-worth. And if people think that you're opting out of it, or if you try, if you're coming out and you're like, Hey, I'm asexual. I don't feel sexual attraction. They sort of, um, you get a lot of fun reactions from people. And I feel like it kind of has parallels to like the whole like veganism thing where sometimes when people like announce that they're vegan, people like people who still like eating meat feel like, Oh, what you think you're better than me? Like, it's really weird. Um, yeah. And um, most of this information uh, came from websites like AVEN, the Trevor Project, um, the LGBTA Wikia, and Ace Week. Um, AVEN is, was like the first major asexual um, online community. It's been around since at least 2010, though that isn't to say that asexuality is a new orientation. Um, it's been around for like pretty much forever, though um, the language around it to describe what it is in the online community itself is relatively kind of new. And a lot, some of it also came from my own lived experience, obviously, because like I'm, I'm asexual. So um, yeah, um, ideally I would love to get this project um, like printed and actually published. Um, I would love for this to actually make some real change in the community because like that was the goal from day one is that, you know, I want there to be more activism and I want to actually make a change. Um, and I would love to get this like um, taught in like schools because in sex ed classes, they're starting to teach that it's possible to be gay, it's possible to be bi. Um, but I have never heard of sex ed classes teaching that there's a possibility that you might not feel sexual attraction towards anyone. Like I know when I was in my own sex ed class that like, like day one, they were like every single one of you are gonna have sex at some point and you're gonna want it, which obviously that's not true. And um, a lot of people who are asexual and don't know it yet, they're gonna internalize that and they might, you know, have sex when they don't want to have it because they assume that they have to have it or they think that maybe everyone feels how they do and people just have sex anyway because what they're supposed to do like people don't even know that this is a possibility like so um yeah and i've actually been invited to speak about this um i think like late january which i'm very excited about and i would love to speak more about it because obviously the more you speak about it you know it raises awareness and um yeah, and also I'm speaking about it right now here. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am so glad I was able to make this and I hope that it makes a difference. Thank you. Kennedy, thank you so much. And I think you can rest assured that your presentation will definitely make a difference. I think you really shined a light on an on a area that has not had a lot of attention. So um, thank you very much. I appreciate your work. Okay, um, and finally, uh, last of our presenters today, I'd like to introduce Michael Perry, uh, whose work is titled Decontextualized Enduring Perspectives on American Immigration. Go right ahead, Michael. Thank you. Hold on, let me just get set up here. Of course. Sorry, this happened in the, the dry run too. Might need to refresh my page here. Hmm. Aha, okay. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Perry, as Denise so kindly introduced me. Um, my project, as she said, is, is titled Decontextualize, um, Enduring Perspectives on American Immigration. And that, that word enduring is meant to have somewhat of a double meaning. Uh, it's, it's not just that the perspectives themselves are enduring, but that they must be endured um, at the same time. So uh, going into this project, I, uh, I knew that I wanted to do something with the, the ideas that had been swirling around in my head since about 2015, 2016, uh, when I saw a lot of friends and family um, really radically change in their ideals and their perspectives, or at least how they professed their ideals and perspectives. And I wanted to understand why and how. So I've done a lot of exploring um, of, of those things in the last few years um, in other classes, 
um, you know, history finals, you know, I'll explore something like ethnocentric nationalism, how it rises. Um, and I, I think that uh, really what I wanted to look at was uh, historical literacy and the lack thereof. Um, you know, people always say that history repeats itself, but I rarely hear them implicate themselves in that reality. Um, and I think that that's a pretty interesting phenomenon. I tend to think that history is actually kind of just ongoing and, and the patterns that are underlying have, have not changed at all. Um, and and that uh, those can be described as through lines. I don't know if anyone here listens to NPR. I love their program through line. You probably do too if you listen to NPR, uh, but it connects uh, historical events to uh, contemporary realities. Um, so another thing I knew I wanted to do with this project was uh, try my hand at creative writing. Um, I, I hadn't really ever written creatively before, but I knew I was a strong persuasive writer, so I wanted to try it. Um, and I wanted to, at first, I wanted to write a novel. Um, and when I realized that I had about a semester and that I had never even written a short story, uh, that was probably a little too much to chew. So I tried to bite off something smaller with the novella. Um, and I, I led with these questions, um, which you know you may have already read, but really they, they relate to the things I talked about in my last slide. So um, why do people uh, become, uh, <laughs> what are people's uh, cultural values and how are they informed by their traumas, their past, their history? Um, how, if they're unaware of their personal history beyond themselves, um, how might their upholding of the cultural values that inform, or the, uh, the, the upholding of their cultural values informed by that history um, might, what are the consequences of, of that? Um, and how does uh, class, both socio, social and economic, relate to one's personal biases in the United States? So those were pretty broad uh, topics and they're pretty broad questions as a result. Um, so I realized when I got started on actually storyboarding and, and uh, getting to know the characters that I was going to write about that I had to narrow it down a little bit. Um, so what I focused on was a family of immigrants in the 1930s, because that is when my family, well, a little earlier than that, but more or less when my family uh, immigrated to the United States. Um, and I wanted to explore how a family that immigrates uh, can two or three, maybe four generations in the future um, become xenophobic um, in the United States? How do, why do they become xenophobic Americans? Um, and how does that happen exactly? Um, so I started with my storyboard. I mean, that, that was going to be my project. So uh, my product it, really, uh, so I tried to uh, lay out the storyboard. This is just a little sampling of it. There's a whole nother page, but uh, I'm going to give you a quick summary here. Uh, it starts in 2015. So it's split up into four decades, a chapter each. Uh, and it starts in 2015 with uh, a teenager who, you know, he's in high school and his parents are pretty xenophobic. Um, you know, not, not non-traditionally so. They're like, the things that come out of their mouths are, are things that we hear pretty frequently uh, from, you know, maybe colleagues, family members, even even friends that you might be disappointed in time to time, maybe even yourself upon reflection, really. Um, and uh, he he's a high schooler. They have a, a mock election in their school. And on Thanksgiving Day, the next day, um, uh, his uncle comes over and the entire family has um, kind of a blowout argument about the about um, voting rights and and who should have them. Um, and then I skip right back in time for the next chapter to 1930, um, when his grandfather, Vincent, is attending his father's funeral. So Vincent was the first uh, uh, person in the family to be born in the United States. Um, and his father had just died on the job at work. Um, and uh, his, uh, his employer, his father's employer, refused to pay the family on the basis of uh, not having any documented people to give the money to. Um, and that uh, really has quite the impact on Vincent. Um, and he goes to school the next day 
and he's bullied by uh, some some kids for just for being Italian um, at the time. And uh, then I skip forwards to 1965. Vincent is an adult, um, and he is uh, having a conflict with his wife because uh, his employer is offering him a promotion, um, and he's refusing to take it which is actually something I pulled out of my personal family history, like quite a few things in, in this story. Um, my grandfather refused to take a promotion from his employer because he didn't trust his employer. Um, and that was an interesting thing to me. I, I did some digging in my family history and talked to a few people. Um, and really it's because it's, it's a matter of distrust and, and uh, personal experience. So that goes back to how do our traumas inform the way we, we view the world, right? Um, and uh, his wife in the story really wants him to take the promotion because she wants to finally own a house. They, they've been living in an apartment, they have two kids um, and, and she sees the chance for economic mobility. Um, and then I skip forward to uh, 2040, uh, which obviously has not happened yet. Um, Matthew is an, now an adult and he uh, is living alone uh, in a one bedroom apartment and uh, there's a climate crisis and an economic crisis. And he finds himself in the situation that he actually has to rely on a family of new immigrants um, to, to get by um, at the end of the story. Um, so I had to really narrow down my research for, for this novella because initially my, my guiding questions were too broad uh, to really get into, you know, not only the immigrant experience, but what's said about immigrants um, in the United States. Um, and so I wanted to uh, research specifically, um, you know, how do people become xenophobic? What is xenophobia? And what is the language and culture of xenophobia in the United States? Uh, and what I found was that it, uh, it has quite the legacy. So in 1911 or so, um, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, commissioned a, a group of people to write something called the Dillingham Reports. Uh, and the Dillingham Report is a 900 something page document. And in it uh, contains, it contains a, a dictionary of races. Um, and of course, at the time, and still, this is another, this is an enduring problem, not just in the United States. Um, the reports didn't uh, distinguish between race, ethnicity, and nationality. Those are all one thing in the minds of many. And this report in many ways uh, is responsible for that, that line of thinking um, and the government policy that's been shaped around that line of thinking. Um, and it also, <laughs> uh, throughout um, the reports, uh, supposes that people with darker skin are more uh, predisposed to being criminals. Um, and I'll show you a few examples of that coming up. Uh, and, and this idea, uh, an enduring idea in the United States is not only that people with darker skin that are coming to the United States are more likely to be criminals, but the idea that they came here illegally in the first place cements that identity as a, a criminal. Um, and, and that all culminates in something known as an absolutized identity. So uh, the idea that no matter who you are as an individual, everybody uh, already has an assumption of exactly who you are, what your values are, and what you're capable of based on uh, your origin or your parents' origin. Um, and, and that's uh, pretty problematic. I mean, it, it's a lot of the trauma that is undergone by immigrants and first generation uh, people in the United States is do and pretty much everywhere is due to the idea of an absolutized identity. Um, and here's a little example, please excuse my shaky uh, highlighting with a mouse. <laughs> I wish I could do it with a, an actual highlighter. Um, but uh, just at the bottom here, I wanna point out uh, that when they're discussing South Italians in, uh, in their race, racial makeup, they point out that there may actually be some infusion of African blood in their stock, um, which actually uh, connects to um, a term. I don't know. It's it's a slur technically, um, although it's not really in use uh, at this point in time because uh, Italians have really become white in the United States. Um, but they were called guineas in the past. My family still uses the word pretty casually, um, and it's uh, 
it actually, having done the research, refers to the fact that they are of African stock. Um, and it refers to Guinea, the part of Africa. Um, and it, it's an insult. I mean, it, it shows you the direct link between white supremacy and, and this specific type of xenophobia. Um, and then this is uh, maybe the most interesting quote um, in, in the Dillingham reports, uh, talking about Southern Italians. Um, it says that they're excitable, impulsive, highly imaginative, and uh, as an individualist, having little adaptability to high organized society. Um, so that that was explicit. It's it's how we recognized these people and uh, it's how our government recognized people. So knowing now that my grandmother was seen by her peers at school as someone that the government said uh, probably just wasn't compatible with civilization, ultimately a savage at the end of the day um, that couldn't be trusted um, was was really uh, important to understand uh, and to see that through line. I mean, I'm I'm an ESL educator um, and I see my students exposed to that line of thinking constantly um, in the implicit biases of their educators and peers and the uh, the, impl the explicit biases as well, um, maybe less often. Um, and then I just want to include this little bit from a newspaper there. Are, I have unending uh, pieces of newspapers uh, that that have this language, but I just wanted to show how little uh, the language of American xenophobia has changed. Um, we're really talking about uh, people that who came into this country surreptitiously and illegally, um, and they left their country for its own good, and they persist to violate our laws, um, and that they're taking advantage of our hospitality, and that they're degrading our institutions. Like this is the exact same language that's always been used. Um, to describe unwanted immigrants in the United States. Um, so getting a little bit to my story, um, in 2015, um, Matthew, the, the, the teenage boy I was talking about, uh, his dad, Peter, is up on the roof um, fixing the, cleaning the chimney. Um, and he, he knows that his mom doesn't want his dad doing that because they're both in their late, their mid fifties at this point. Um, and that's a pretty unsafe thing to be doing. Um, but his dad also doesn't want to hire help because they can't really afford it. Um, and he, uh, with pride, ties a rope around the base of the chimney and through his belt loops and cleans the chimney that way, which is a thing I've seen my father do. <laughs> um, and I, uh, he, with pride, says, um, you know, a guinea rigged it myself, which is another thing I've heard plenty of times in my family, which is an interesting contrast to a little later in the same chapter, when his wife insists that he actually hires someone to um, clean the chimney, that person ends up being an immigrant because it's what they can afford is undocumented labor. Um, and uh, he ends up being xenophobic just to the idea of having his labor replaced in that way. Um, and starts to say things like, if he falls off the roof, whose tax money is gonna pay for his hospital visit kind of thing, which you know we've heard that a million times too. Not going to read this whole thing, but uh, this is Vincent's experience uh, in school. Um, I picked a little bit from my family history on this one too. My grandmother used to tell me and my sister is how uh, she was really embarrassed to uh, be bringing cold cut sandwiches to school every day for lunch because all the other girls had peanut butter and jelly and that they would make fun of her for it. Um, and uh, I, you know, I can see that um, echoed in my students and what they bring for lunch. And I, I mean, we all know that that's, uh, food can be a really important cultural marker that uh, can, can show people whether you're from here or not, right? Um, and the, they're likely to make fun of you for it. Um, and to hear that it happened about cold cut sandwiches in the past really drives home the fact that that hasn't changed either. Um, and this other thing, Vinny the Guinea with the meatball eyes is what the students call him in school. It's also something my aunt Ginny was called, Ginny the, Vin the Guinea with the meatball eyes. That's a way she was ridiculed in school and something that she remembered. So it was just another thing that I wanted to pull out there. Um, so uh, to reflect here, my, my story isn't finished. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, it's a joy to write, but it's also a challenge. I've never really written creatively before, like I said. 
Um, but I've been really grateful to have my uh, advising professor, Mike Geary, helping me out through it. Um, I guess I would ask everyone in the audience to uh, reflect um, on how well they know their own past um, and what they can understand, uh, what they can expect from their future. future. And that's because uh, through my research, I learned something about the relationship between privilege and oppression. And that's that we may, we may often misunderstand it. Uh, we tend to assume, uh, in the public narrative anyway, that people without very much are likely to step on other people in order to get more. But the reality is that people with enough are so afraid of losing it that they oppress people that might take it from them. Um, and and that's, that's really the problem uh, with how xenophobia can manifest and not just xenophobia. I mean, it's, it is the, the mixture of xenophobia, racism, patriarchy, it's, it's all of it um, together. Um, and I want you all to understand the next time you might hear someone say like, well, if they come to our country, they need to speak our language or, or they need to respect the flag, something like that. Um, there's a relationship also between assimilation and socioeconomic mobility. And if everyone in, in the United States collectively agrees that you have to be, um, you have to forfeit your cultural identity from your origin, um, then that is the only way you will be able to get enough uh, money to actually accumulate wealth and, and have um, be like a landowning citizen of the United States, um, which is is really like security in your future, right? I mean, that's, that's a many people's goal. Um, so, we need to kind of deconstruct this relationship between assimilation and socioeconomic mobility in the United States and give opportunities to people that might not actually have the most interest in uh, like knowing our language and, and not speaking their own or like respecting our flag above their own. Uh, I don't know if I have another minute here, something interesting I learned. Um, and Denise, you can cut me off. Is that your... Well, we're almost at one o'clock, but I don't want to really cut you off. So go finish your thought. Finish your <laughs> All thought. right. My, my last thought here is uh, something I something I learned um, when I was researching the Pledge of Allegiance um, was that prior to the 1930s, uh, it actually was I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation with liberty and one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. They changed my flag because they were concerned that uh, immigrants might have a different flag in mind when they spoke those words. And it used to end with, um, you know, uh, slamming your arms down by your side, stomping on the floor and saying, uh, one flag, one language, one country. And that was the end of the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, so that wasn't that long ago. It's what my grandparents lived through. And uh, I can guarantee that a very similar iteration and manifestation of this reality is is occurring uh, in the present with with the the youth of today. So, thank you all for listening, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you very much, Mike, um, and thank you to all of our presenters today, and to all of you in the audience. Um, we did have four presenters, so we are just about at one o'clock. I would like to see if anybody wants to offer a quick comment or question. I don't want to keep too many people past the. Uh, specified time, but I also want to give people a chance to ask a question if they've been dying to for this whole time. Anybody question or comment, I can look for your hands. Uh, we have some great comments in the chat. I'd like our presenters to run through that if you have a chance. Or shall we leave it there? Honestly, I liked all the presentations. There was a lot of information, but they were all different and it was interesting to hear about topics that I wouldn't normally think about. Thank you. Thank you. And it's interesting that, you know, it's, it's one of the, you know, this is the beauty of education, right? That uh, people come to college and they start walking down the path that speaks to them um, and find other people who have that language and build from there. And as you can see, we had a really wide variety of discussion today, um, all super interesting and uh, a lot of great food for thought. Anybody else, last minute comment or question before we close up? Thank you all for the comments, nice comments in the chat. Appreciate that. Okay, it is one. So, um, 
to our four presenters and our honor students, wonderful. I'm so happy to see you reach this point um, where you're finishing up honors and you know you, you walk down this road into these neat projects. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you to our audience. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know that some of you came yesterday and here you are again today. Uh, there is one more day tomorrow to finish up our, our week. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to end this except to say thank you. Really appreciate your company. Have a great afternoon and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you guys so much.